380. We're banging them out. Number. We are banging them out. We have, uh, by, by special request, we have Ron Gilson back with us because he had such a powerful, <laughs> powerful <laughs> golf clip. Uh, Redebut, we will call it. Um, he's he's been on hiatus, traveling the world, <laughs> and he's back now. Though uh, we have Pat, uh, Jimmy Dalpiaz with us, Ron Gloucester, Ron Gilson with us. You can say hi, Ron. Hi. There's a video. That, that's your camera. Oh, right? Hi. There you go. <laughs> Scotty Mack is with us. Where's my camera? Your camera's oh, there okay. too, okay, buddy. All right. And Pat Dalpiaz <laughs> is morning. under the weather. A little bit. A little bit. I am going to have to get my computer and completely disinfect it. This is why I'm out here in the hinterlands. You're in the, you're in the hinterlands over there, but your fingers are all over my keyboard. I'm totally fucked. Speaking of weather, what is the weather today, Joe? Weather is, I would, for this year, uh, unseasonably mild. Is that right? Would we say that? Yeah. Unse uh, yeah, it's fourth it's, warmest January on record. Is that what they're saying? It is. It, it was five. Now we're at four. I still don't, we, we talk about this almost every week, I still don't want to jinx it because five years ago when we had that monstrous winter, all, we, we got through, we got all the way through January with barely a, a, a drop of snow and then it just kept, yeah. kept coming. Yeah. I so I don't want to jinx it because I remember saying to Kate, we're, we are... We're basically home free. We only got like another month of winter, and then it just came and came and came. So. Well, you've just got another week or two, and then you'll be sitting with all the sun and everything else, and what do you care what the S word is? I can't. When is Groundhog Day? Is it March? It's this uh, Sunday. February it's, uh, 2nd. Oh, February yes, 2nd? Super up. Bowl. Yeah. So, wow. Okay, so... So Mark Ring, Mark Ring was here earlier, and his, his Mark Ring comes in, and he, it's like he always has... A, a scripted like monologue whenever he comes into the office with, yeah, the, with the fisherman. You should talk about this. Well, not for us, but he, like he had for the fisherman. That's usually his audience in the office, and me and Frank and and whoever else is here. Um, but his his monologue uh, his monologue today was that this may be the least publicized Super Bowl that he can remember ever, and I think we all. Agree that that's probably the case, especially in our area, and the reasons we come up with. Right after uh, the right after championship weekend, which was almost two weeks ago, we had this the, the Astros cheating scandal right. that dominated the headlines. We the went, firing of all the managers. The firing of all the managers that dominated the headlines. Now we have Kobe Bryant and the impeachment hearings. Yes. So yes. it's. So that like it's uh, it's pretty crazy because the, the the Super Bowl is generally, I mean, it, Super Bowl. What, what, what Super Bowl. can I say yeah. about that? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, yeah that's, I think you know the what biggest stage. Now that I think of it, they've even shown one commercial, um, out there with the Boston Park the cars and it, it's Hyundai commercial. Hyundai, yeah, Big Poppy. Um, yeah, Chris Pratt. Um, but I, well, John Krasinski from The Office. Right, so one or two locals, commercials. All locals from Massachusetts. Yeah. One or two commercials are trying to, they're showing that. Maybe to drum up a little interest to saying, because everyone talks about, I don't care about the Super Bowl sometimes, I just wanted to see the commercials. I was wondering so, if they taped it thinking it, the Super Bowl was going to include Boston. I mean, they must have taped um, that a while ago. That yeah, was originally think... going to be a Super Bowl commercial. Oh, uh, really? That's what I was wondering. Yeah, I don't know. Probably. I mean, there's, there's a, usually a good chance of it. So right. They... Well, speaking of that, we saw last night a Jordan's Furniture commercial where he's talking about all the different things he's selling, and in the middle of him selling his product, the phone rings, and he goes, oh, hi, Tom. How can I help you? <laughs> and he's going on this way, and finally he says at the end, sure, we can do that, but could you tell us where we're going to deliver? deliver everything to oh funny and yeah. then he and he looks at the camera and he smiles and i went well you know. i read a report this morning that they're living in manhattan right now did you see what Gronk said last night in this press conference oh, at, I at, 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 no i did not see that scary scary mm -hmm. so Gronk, who's who is 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 just chipping away at my at, at you know who's the most 
He could have retired, just retired and been like the most lovable guy. Big Poppy's pretty lovable. Bobby O, lovable. Uh, you know, guys in Boston sports history. He's like what he did last year, like stringing them along, knowing he was going to retire, but not announcing it. And then this year saying he's going to have a huge press announcement before, right before the season was going to start. And then he said, oh, we're having a big Super Bowl party. Come down to our Super Bowl party. And then and he did the CBD. That then, was he had a, big then, he, then he got everybody riled up again and he announced his affiliation with the CBD company. But yesterday he's, he is in the, the press for the Super Bowl, the press uh, media row. And he says, and I, I don't necessarily disagree with him, but his, uh, but his thought, they asked him about what Tom Brady should do or what he thinks he's going to do. And he said that, well, Tom Brady should, uh, has earned every right to explore free agency and uh, see what's out there, which is absolutely the truth. But I didn't realize this. This morning, they said that if Tom Brady goes to free agency, his salary is going to be counted there's going to be a double cap hit on our on the salary cap for the Patriots, um, or the cap hit, whatever. However, it works. It's gonna, it's gonna exceed. If he, it's gonna no. What's gonna happen is it's going to make the however the cap works. It's going to greatly increase the chance that the Patriots move on from him. If he, because there's something that trig that gets triggered, that will exponentially increase the odds that he actually plays someplace else. Because mm. the Patriots are all about, like you know, value and numbers and stuff like that. And if they think that they can get a player that can perform eighty percent as well for forty percent of the cost, now if he goes to free agency, the the, the perceived cost to the team. If he goes to free agency, it would double, mm-hmm. and which. But that comes at a scary. cost too. I mean, no matter who they put in in the quarterback role, um, if he does move on, it's going to impact them significantly in, in season ticket sales, and and merchandising and all the other stuff that's that goes along with that. So I mean, you got to watch that that line too. Yeah, they say he was the, he had the number two selling jersey. I think this past. But don't you think that he had some sort of clause in his contract, but he took those pay cuts for all those years so he could have weapons uh, to throw to receivers, tight ends and stuff, and he, they didn't produce that. That's not true. Him. I don't believe that's true. So in the beginning of the season, there were articles being written in the beginning of the season about how the, he, there was an embarrassment of riches at the wide receiver spot. Mohamed Sanu was supposed to be a stud. Mm-hmm. Josh Gordon when he performed, was a stud. He was on yeah, the yeah, roster. Yeah. Antonio Brown was there. He yes. was a stud. You right. couldn't predict that Antonio Brown was going to Im- no. self-implode. No, no, you, you get you a point there. The beginning of the season, the we were of the unstoppable. Season, they were, the, the first two games, we, we were already write, writing uh, checks for the Super Bowl tickets. Yeah. yeah. So, I, so that rhetoric, which mainly comes from the Boston sports media because they want to act like, you know, they're not, they're not trying to do the right thing all the time when they always are trying to do the right thing, in my opinion. But why did, Why would, my question is, why would Brady take those pay cuts all those years to do that? I believe that they have a way around it and to get him the money. And does that come the last year in bonuses, in which can, um, with the I, salary cap? See, is I, I have, this is my theory, and it's a cynical kind of a theory. That's a full circle question I'm asking. Do you think during the salary cap, you said a double cap, is that going to impact that in a decision-making process maybe this season? I think that, you know how he took he took the less pay cuts every year? I think that they find ways to get, I think that just like presidents that or, or congresswomen or congressmen, that they have a $190,000 salary, but after a couple of terms, they're worth $200 million dollars. I think that there are ways to funnel money to these people that aren't necessarily through their salary. So I think like you like so say say you're say you're a president, right? And you you make one hundred ninety thousand dollars, whatever. I I don't know what the number is. Say a half a million dollars, whatever it is. Not it's it's not really what they're making, all right. So if they if someone wanted to make a book deal and say we're going to give you a book deal for for five million dollars, 
you sign up for, for the publishing thing. And even if the books, even if they didn't sell a single book, he gets the check for five to $5 million. So the salary cap stays within. He takes the pay cut and the side deals like the book and make the up for what the pay cut is. Even if it's never sold. TB12 having their okay. facility at the... That's a good point. What I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's how it works, but that's my theory. You've got a couple of comments from Craig on this topic. Oh, hi, Craig. Oh, Craig says uh, the Pats' arrogance is why they took Antonio Brown. They thought he would fall in line and wear suckers. And Everybody uh-huh. knew AB was a time bomb. Everyone, I agree with and Craig. And they may not want to take the hit and lose him, so they may take a two-year deal, and he or his wife will accept. Well, Antonio Brown is now on a higher. different line. He's in jail, huh? getting meals. Yeah, yeah. I think that. I think. Line I think. Uh, my my guess would be if I if I'm Giselle Bun- Bunchen, right, and living in Brookline, which Boston to 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 Giselle Bunchen is not no no disrespect to our friends because I love the city of Boston, but it is an absolute probably a third tier town compared to some of the cities that she could be accustomed mm-hmm. and and has the wealth to live in, mm-hmm. like a New York City. In L.A., you know, the suburbs of L.A., um, she could live, I mean, they could live wherever they wanted to live, right? Mm. Uh, Boston, living in, working in, living in Brighton, it's in the in the middle of the, in the winter or whatever, not exactly, or, or Newton or whatever, wherever they live, I'm not even sure where they live, but was it Brighton or, or Brooklyn? Brooklyn. 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 Not exactly. Lots of fur coats. Lots of fur coats. But Giselle Bunchen, worldly woman making all no, my not, I wouldn't be shocked if they doesn't like, add up. You know, and, and her still she's probably still trying to hang on to her supermodel thing. Where are the gigs? New York City, closest places, right? Mm. I don't know. I it's just my theory that they don't Tom Brady doesn't owe this city anything. I am I know that I'm in the minority when I say I wish that they would move on from him and not overpay him right now. I and I wish that he would have retired last year after the, after they won the Super Bowl. But I wish that they would move in. I wish they would take in a quarterback that a good quarterback that a good young quarterback for a third of his salary, groom him and 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 build, and understand that we may not have a Super Bowl year next year, but we're, we're going to start the rebuilding process because you only got a couple, you really legitimately only have a, would potentially only have a couple of years with Tom Brady regardless. Mm-hmm. And to oh, and to overpay him to, oh, to just because he's Tom Brady when there are probably six or seven better quarterbacks in the league right now, I would rather not. So over, should he hang him. it up or should he go to another team? Should he not play or should he play? Um, because, I would uh, say I would say what that's re- he's earned. I agree with Gronk as much as I hate hearing it. I agree with Gronk. He's earned if he wants to play. I can't imagine why he still wants to play, other than uh, you know wanting to prove well, that he can do it. With, that he, he still wants to play. That he can do it right. He has that he can do it without Belichick. That it wasn't that he was the reason, not necessarily Belichick. Because well, he might have something to prove there. I agree. I agree. They're probably like an old married couple that, like, you know, have, are, are tired. You know, they're tired of like, you know, little things build up over time. Well, Montana and, gave him the advice of don't do it, don't move on, yeah. and he didn't. He and finished Eli up with just shut down. Kings. Eli said, "I'm a giant, not going to play for them. I'm yeah. not even going to look yeah. anywhere else." You know, I've been saying it all along. I've been saying way back, check all the things. He he wants to go look at check free agency, and that's why I firmly believe he's going to play somewhere else. I firmly believe. I, up until Gronk's statements, I, I, I was in the other camp that he's, this is all smoke and mirrors and he was going to re-sign with the Patriots, and now I'm 50-50. Well, there it is. Where, that's, where, up for, where, that's up for debate. Where are you? Uh, we'll where, where are you? Do you, where are you thinking you play, where, do you think he plays the Patriots somewhere else or nowhere next year? Robbie Kraft has publicly stated that he has every intention in signing Brady. So it's it's if they can come to terms with the agency and the money. That's all that, that's what it comes down to. 
Um, I, I don't think that the rumors of him selling his house, it is for sale, but it yeah, hasn't been that, sold yet and moving out. Yeah, that doesn't. To me, that doesn't. But that's a forty million dollar house that keeps dropping by three million because you have to. You can't just sell a house like that overnight. Right. No, I you agree. have to have it on the market. There's not that many people in the world that can come over here and say, "I want to buy Tom Brady's house for forty million and have the means to do so." So with him selling that and the rumors that he's not coming here because he sold his house, means totally nothing. false. Means, means nothing. No, that means I agree. That means no, that means nothing. To me. So Ron, I say leave you it up for debate. You leave it. You, so you, you don't. You have. No, I'm on fifty fifty with you're you. You're fifty fifty with me. Uh, you know, I'm not uh, that familiar with uh, this whole uh, subject you're talking about, but I sit back here and I listen, and I say to myself, um, Frank Sinatra was one of the greatest, if not the greatest, entertainers in the world, and he hung around so long that he was starting to forget the lyrics and so forth. Sometimes you have to know when to quit. Every politician has, has his day. Entertainers, and I consider sports figures entertainers. They all have their day, and uh, you know, maybe he maybe performed at a high level this past year, despite yeah. you know, with not having weapons, and 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 uh, more than the weapons to me yes. was the offensive line in yeah. shambles. I, like yes. I, 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 I think that that was a greater. Cause not having enough time to find. He did not receivers. have any help. He didn't have any help, but I think that like everybody points to the receivers and the running back yeah. because they're sexy. They're much sexier to talk about. I believe that the the major the majority of his problems stemmed from. See, out of the pocket his, too soon because the line couldn't find his receivers in time. Yeah. No help. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, anyway, there we go. Um, I want to. Oh, I'm going to let you have the floor with your your pitch for. Okay. The Rose B- B- uh, Baker Senior Center. Yes. Uh, uh, no, fine. Can I go? Go for that, yeah. That topic right there. <laughs> Great. Uh, yesterday I had a conversation with uh, uh, Lucy Sheehan, who was the director of the Rose Baker uh, Senior Center, and I explained uh, my uh, request. Uh, the Rose Baker Senior Center entertains uh, its... Uh, clientele, if you will, its members, uh, three times a, a month on Mondays, one to three, with the Old Salty Jazz Band. Now, I've known that they've been in, in existence for years, and I never attended, but several weeks ago, I went for the first time, and uh, the band is uh, consists of about 10 musicians, and it's led or organized uh, by a fellow by the name of Dave Sag. A great bass player plays at the rum line every week, I guess, Joe. And uh, you know, the band is just a fantastic uh, group of musicians. They're all old guys, but they're all talented, very talented musicians. I know some of them. Years ago, I played with some of them, and uh, they, I, I, I could mention names, but I don't know all the names, and it wouldn't, wouldn't be fair. But problem as I went in that big hall and the band was knocking themselves out uh, there was no audience uh, not even someone to dance with and the dance floor is open and I'll tell you right now uh, as a musician myself over the years believe me the 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 ultimate for a musician is to have an audience they perform before an audience without an audience it's just an empty room and uh, these talented men deserve uh, deserve that. So I talked with Lucy yesterday, and I said, if I got the authority to go out and try and promote this a little bit, and uh, and she gave me carte blanche uh, authority, and I'm here today as the first uh, salute. Uh, thanks to Joey Shemantaro and Good Morning Gloucester, and uh, I just I urge seniors uh, or uh, anyone to come in off the street on a Monday afternoon at 1 o'clock, 1 to 3, and dance for free and hear the best music that's being offered on KPN by talented musicians. It's a great venue, and uh, we should take advantage of it, and I'm looking forward to pumping it up. That's excellent. So that's the first Monday, first three Mondays of every month month from 1 to 3. 1 to 3. All right. Thank you, Ron, for that. That's and is excellent. there an admission charge? What's that? 
Yeah. Is there a ticket price or an admission no, charge? No, it's free. That's Walk what I thought, in, yeah. And they'll even give you a cup of coffee at uh, at break time, one thirty at two, th- 2 o'clock or so. By the way, in the last couple of weeks I've been there, we've had Gordon Baird as an entertainer for the first oh, two or three oh, numbers, and i got to tell you, he's a, he's a zany guy, but he's a very talented guy, and uh, he puts over a song anyway. Come on down and, wow. and, and a be sell, entertaining. A sellout. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, um, oh, Scotty. Yes. Our props to you on your tremendous performance when we went to, uh, as, a, as the host, when we did the interview at Mom's Kitchen. So we Thank have a, you. So any, if anybody, I'm going to link to link to the Mom's Kitchen uh, vid, uh, interview that we did um, on premises, first look video. Got a tremendous response uh, online, uh, but you did a great job hosting it. They're, they're looking to open up on um, next Monday. Yeah, so, coming right up. Yeah, coming right up. So we're hoping to, it really depends on my work schedule. If I can get away uh, Sunday morning, we're going to do a lot. We're going to do the podcast live. Can I thank you back for, for the opportunity oh, there you go. to do that? Because I want to say that was my first ever interview. I've never done an interview before. Really? Uh, that was my first. You're and natural. You, and, and you never forget your first, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. Uh, so that so is thank that. you. Thank you. And we'll put, a, we'll put a link in the show notes. Thank if you, you haven't heard about it or seen it, there's, there's the picture. We, we did a whole tour upstairs and downstairs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they've been really good to us. So we're going to, well, what do I always say to the people that are good to us? We try to pay them back tenfold. That's, absolutely. That's our goal. Like the people that. When we, we pimp them and they they don't give us breakfast goodies, we don't hear from, you don't hear from them again. So are we telling they, everybody they, to show up there for Monday or Tuesday this week? Well, we're gonna be well, we're gonna be there Sunday morning. But if I don't have work, and I think it calls for bad weather, but I'm not sure. Um, so to to do a live podcast, but they I don't think they're gonna have their permit to open until Monday. So I think the first day that they open, I don't know that we can take all this. I would rather them have seeds to. To sell, right, to, to sell, sell to food people. and make Absolutely. recoup some of that money that they're putting into that. Yeah, place. but the bottom line is um, more seating. Uh, I saw the whole new grill area. That's going to be great. And they have Wi-Fi. And that's like three big selling points that for anyone coming in. But there'll be more. More to follow. How about parking, Jerry? Well, you know. It's better. It's a better situation there. I oh, definitely. So. Yeah. There you go. Um we, you want you had a couple of happy birthdays to, to, to oh put yeah um so a very special happy birthday going out to your friend Joe and mine our friend um the place where you actually got engaged if a lot of people do not know this I'm sure you've talked about it many times on on the podcast but um for the element of surprise I was told you you chose the crow's nest in Gloucester that's right yeah. and the um the happy birthday today goes out from the entire me personally and the entire good morning Gloucester crew to Mary Ann Shatford yes so happy birthday to Mary Ann Shatford love her she's she's yep. she's been so Wonderful. good to us and another um um a local lobsterman actually and and roommate of mine uh Larry Hudson so happy birthday to Larry Hudson Larry's as well happy birthday to Larry Hudson. you Larry there you go um, and Kelly Foot and, and yes, oh, oh and yes. Joey Foot. Thank Which you, said, Joey Foot. Mm-hmm. Joey, Foote. thank you, Pat. Yeah, thank you for well. that. That's very good. We uh, saved the best for last, Joey. <laughs> there you go. Um, I wanted to mention the left right center tournament at the Elks. Uh, you want to speak to that? Uh, sure. Uh, left right center is uh, a dice game that's played, and um, it's tournament style. Uh, they do a scholarship for the Elks scholarship fund with a fifty fifty raffle. Uh, food available from Yellow Sub Shop uh, for purchase, and they do have a cash bar. Um, it's put on by uh, Corey Kukuru from the Bridge Cape Band. Um, it's now going into, I want to say, its fifth or sixth year. Yeah, and we've, we've gone a couple times. They are it so is, much fun. It is a great time, and they and they sell out. So yeah. uh, it's close go, to being sold out. I believe. I'm sure. I bet you it is. So if if don't leave the podcast. <laughs> mm-hmm. As soon as the podcast is over, go and go online and get your t- order your tickets uh, from the bridge. Uh, there's a there's a link on Corey Cooker's page or or on the bridge uh, cape band dot com. The um, they can get tickets on there. I will be the MC and DJ for the evening. It's a great time. Um, it's it's fun because it's almost like um, I say like a wrestling match when it gets down to the final tables in the bracket. Yep. People I've been in, want I've been entrance there. music. I've been there. I was on the final. And they request two, their so own the entrance music. 
I was too. You 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 got there too? Yeah, I got there. So I got so, there. so Jim, what would you request for entrance music? If if you may, if you were to make it to the final table and you were coming in to, to roll some dice, what would be your uh, your inter, uh, entrance music? Oh, probably something I don't know, West Side Story. You know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> something. You know, they're, they're shooting the dice uh, down in the in the city streets. I don't know. Well, I, how about you? What would you choose for entrance music? As a, I know as a musician. I'm not a I'm not a, a gambler. If you will. <laughs> he would he would, he would, pick, he would do some kind of band. He used to be playing a banjo band, so it'd be like some Were kind. Were you of, in the Union Hill banjo band? Yeah, yeah. I remember them. Do you? Yes, really? I do. With that was uh, his coffee shop. With with yeah. um with Robert Wynott. Yeah, Bob Wynott. Yes, yeah, he a, came aboard later. He was, a, he, was a, he was part of it though. Yeah, so I do remember the Union Hill banjo yeah. band. That was his place. He yeah. started the wow. Union Hill wow. coffee wow. shop. Yeah. And I, I, I understand that you have some more history for us today, too, is coming up. I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, Joey, for your entrance music, what would you choose? Probably the Gloss Until the End uh, song. Oh, awesome. Uh, the podcast song. The podcast song, yeah. Okay. I was thinking something more along the lines of, like, maybe Tumbling Dice from Rolling Stones. Oh, uh, yeah, that'd be a good one. See, Scotty has a, a put, his, is it, in, in, Ron That's is an encyclopedia yeah. of his class yeah. of history. Scotty, Scotty, yeah. and like yeah. his, his DJ, he's like. Well, like nobody this. asked, but I go with "When You Wish Upon a Star." <laughs> That's a good one, Pat. Yeah, yeah. 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 A good one, right? Uh, we, we were going to get to yeah. that. I but know. You, I'm sorry. That's yeah. okay. You seem like you're feeling a little better, Pat. You're yes, you're starting to. Starting to be proactive. She, started, yeah. she has a flash. So, Joe, that's it's February 1st. Jacket. She's a, that's this it? Saturday coming. This Saturday, February yeah. 1st. And tell people where they can buy the tickets again. Uh, uh, TheBridgeCapeBand.com and then on the, the Facebook page or Corey Kukuru's, uh page as well. There you go. go I, I, if there's an event over the course of the year that I that I, I say you 100% you'll have a good time. you got to try it We'll once. be at you capacity. capacity. We will be at full capacity. Yeah, yeah. So if, if you don't have your tickets already, we recommend after the podcast, yeah. go on and grab them. Yeah, do that. Um, we just have a few more things of business because I want to really hand the floor over to Ron, but he's going to take a while. So I want to just get the, the bang out a couple of other pieces of business. Um, the Okay. This is something I want to talk about. Because there's so much sickness going around, I want to give a couple of what we, we're going to go around and we're going to talk about what our home remedies would be. And I think that people should take advantage of every single thing that they could That's take advantage of. That's a great advantage. idea. Yeah. Right now, definitely go, A, go get vaccinated if you haven't been vaccinated. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's stupid not to. The, the, the science proves it out, okay? Um, but there is, so... Kate's sister, Erin, my sister-in-law, who's a teacher, they, they, her, school, her school system, all the teachers have been taking elderberry, which is available at the Common Crow. Not, and they have a ton of kids that are out with the flu. Not one of the teachers has like got... Like gummies, or what are they? I don't, I'm not sure, but okay. I, Felicia's going to get it for us today. And we're going we're gonna to be starting the elderberry. So there's that. So who, who brought up the thing at, at Saver Wine and Cheese? Uh, uh, Scott. Yeah, Scott. so I, I, I was given some information that uh, uh, you know, a very good friend of mine's <laughs> daughter has uh, had the flu uh, strain B this season, and she had recommended going to uh, the Savory and getting the uh, marrow. It's like a, a marrow that you can get. It's, I think you can only get it there, to be honest. I'm actually, I haven't heard about it anywhere else. But bone marrow, bone, bone, some I type of. I think it's a bone marrow. Yeah. Uh, I'll, we'll get back to you on that one, um, yeah. just for maybe Sunday's podcast. We'll we'll do a follow up. Yeah, we'll follow up on it. But oh, know yeah, that you can go idea. there, and if you say bone marrow something, that's good they'll, for they'll know the what nutrients you're... to yeah. help fend off the flu. It, it gets all that stuff, you know, into you that you need as your body's fighting. Right, so. and my and my go to is Adele's Gumbo from Passports, which is, when you talk about bone marrow, they throw all the bones oh. in the, into the stock pot with the veggies. And, that sounds like a win and, and it's basically, it's, can, it's boiled down and, and, and boiled down and boiled down and so co- such concentrated vitamins, um, and it's warm. Um, that is my number one. When Kate is really sick, I, I, I just yeah. I just drive straight down there. I get it to go. It's it's very inexpensive. It's like six fifty for a big portion. And what's it called? 
Adele's gumbo. Adele's gumbo. Adele's gumbo. They have it to go. They have a nice uh, container that they'll they'll send you out. I say that's a perfect dish for the Super Bowl parties uh, to prevent sickness. <sighs> yeah, that's go down not a the bad passports idea at and all. get the Adele's gumbo. The passports, right? Adele's gumbo. Yeah. Oh, we should we should mention. Um, oh, I'm gonna just okay, I'm just gonna run through these a, a couple of um, events that are happening. Uh, the we talked about Hale Street. Uh, so the Savor Wine and Cheese is having a, a wine and cheese tasting seminar, um, and that is going to be uh, January 30th from 6 to 8 p.m. So when you go to get your bone marrow stuff, you can go and sign up for that. It's tomorrow. Yeah. It's tomorrow. So, yeah. so if you're watching that right now, go check that out. I can't believe it's that late in January I already. I know. Yeah. Ta- Tano is doing a Super Bowl catering. Uh, you, you, need to, uh, you can call... Uh, oh, actually, it might be. Uh, it's, that's gone yeah. by. You can't yeah. order it anymore because they were just do, they were doing it. Um, but but we heard it went over really big. <laughs> we heard it went over. Oh, that's right. Great job, Anthony Caterano and the Caterano. team. Yeah. January thirtieth, French wine dinner at Feather and Wedge. We talked about that, and I think that that was all that Perfect. I want. Okay, so we're good. So now we're going to get back to. Uh, now uh, we'll get to, we're going. What Heather, Heather is suggesting. Brodo, my kids Bro, call Bro, it magic Brodo, soup. Brodo, yeah. Sorry, it's, I never heard of it. I didn't know what. So it Brodo is like a chicken soup, like oh. a, the, 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 when you really? make a, when you make a chicken soup. Uh huh. The broth. The, the broth stuff is that. Bro, Brodo. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. It's, there you go. See Heather. Heather Day. Thank She's you, a Heather. Local. Thank yeah. you, Heather. Yeah, my, that's that's a, like every Italian household. You like that's what the mother makes chicken soup. I, I was just gonna mm-hmm. say when you're talking about this, I was getting flashbacks to my aunts. Because there was uh, there was eight of us. My mom's home, you know, and there was eight of us. And the aunts came over, and if not one got it, we all got it. So everybody came over to help. Yeah. And I just remember trying all these different. This aunt saying, "Oh, you got to do this. Uh, the garlic, wearing the garlic, or putting the garlic out there, so that would keep that going and put the." Uh, I just remember all the different things. Yeah. No, it's great. Um, so there's that. We got now. Ron. So Ron was here. Uh, two podcasts Earlier. ago, yeah. Yeah. and he was speaking. We spoke a lot about so interesting, uh, uh, very interesting. I was watching not not from here, but obviously, like everybody at home is watching, and I was very interested. So I'm actually well, we t- we, that I get to sit right next to you now and see it live. We had a conversation afterwards, and I invited him to come back on, and he was nervous about too, uh, being overexposed, too much exposure, and people would get tired of him. <coughs> And what my response to him was, there are certain topics that people can tire of potentially, and we hear that often, but Gloucester history is one of those topics that is almost as a universally loved. Anybody is, is interested in that. So I, I don't think that there's any chance of what, what he's going to be talking about for people to be to tire of. Like I know we get, we I have get, to agree with that 100%. Yeah. Yeah, so there's that. So, um, but he wanted to speak. Uh, uh, he went back and he looked over his notes and listened to the podcast, and he wanted to follow up with some of the Cameron's history and W. A. Robinson uh, shipbuilding in the 30s and 40s, and also more about the Crane Estate in Ipswich and its contribution to the fishing industry. So, that's your cue, Ron. Let's bring him on. All right, so, Ron, Ron I want you to remind you. This is your camera. There's yeah, your this camera is the camera. camera. Okay. <laughs> Uh, just as Joey said, I went uh, home and I uh, I listened to my uh, my little presentation the other day, and I said to myself, "There's so much history that's associated or could be connected to Camerons of Gloucester, not the Camerons that uh, they're tearing down as I speak or taking away the uh, the uh, dunnage, but." Uh, the Camerons that was there in 1945. So uh, I said, I, I, I'd really like to ha- go back and uh, and add to or embellish what uh, what I uh, talked about the other day. And, and it's a very interesting story. But in anything that I present, uh, we talked about the Patriots today, we talked about the flu and the symptoms and remedies. And, uh, you know... Uh, I'm not a sportsman uh, and other things. So 
But on the subject of history, uh, when uh, Scotty brought up about uh, the Chamber of Commerce building and what was there before and so forth, you know, that's that's kind of like my forte. I, uh, you know, that's I, why we got you here. Yeah. Well, anyway, so in reflecting on the whole thing, I want to tell you a couple of stories that uh, that uh, have uh, never been told, and in some cases, they're backstories that. Uh, that, uh, uh, you know, some people prefer that they be uh, uh, put to bed. However, in researching my book, An Island No More, uh, back in uh, 2001, uh, it was published in 2006 or seven. Uh, I came upon this uh, story about uh, William A. Robinson, uh, it's an interesting character, and he dates back to 1935 when uh, Bill Robinson was a, a young man, and you must remember that in 1935, 36, 37, that was the era of the Great Depression. There wasn't a lot of work, and people were out of work and so forth, and Robinson, uh, you know, he was kind of a gay blade, kind of a, uh, you know, devil-may-care guy, and he had an old sailboat, and he sailed to the South Seas. Well, he's uh, sailing around, something happens to the boat, and he has to make a harbor, and he pulls into the harbor and uh, for repairs or whatever. And uh, while he's there and uh, tied up or whatever, he, he, he meets a, a fellow by the name of Cornelius Crane, young, another young man. Uh, however, Crane uh, is a little better finance than Robinson. But anyway, they become best friends. What, what harbor? You said he pulled into a harbor. I have, Which harbor? I have no idea, okay. Joey. Okay, so. uh, but somewhere in the, in the South Seas, as the story goes, well, uh, Crane says, you know, uh, when we get back to the States, I'd like to invite you to my summer, my parents' summer home, and uh, we'll have a little reception for you and so forth. So they did get back to uh, the States, and uh, the invitation was extended to Robinson, and Robinson arrived in Ipswich on the Crane Estate. Now, for those who aren't familiar with the Crane Estate, it's, it's more than an estate. It's a palace, a palatial place. It's a, do, you, do, you, do you know what year that was erected? Yeah, that was right about 1936 or uh, 37. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, anyway, uh, you know, there's an orchestra and, a, you know, a buffet and whatever, the whole, whole nine yards and and Crane, of course, was the plumbing magnet. Uh, Cornelius' father, the senior Crane, was a, you know, the Crane plumbing. He was the General Motors of the plumbing industry. You see the toilets all, to this day, you see the toilets all yes, over Yes, that's right. So, uh, you know, there was a lot of money there. And uh, anyway, Bill Robinson uh, met uh, Cornelius' sister, Florence, and uh, they became romantically entangled, and uh, they eventually married. A few years went by, and, uh, you know, all this is approximate. It's in the 30s. And uh, they get married, and uh, the father-in-law now says, uh, you know, your ambition was always to be a boat builder, and why don't we build a, a, a boat yard, a shipyard, on the Crane Estate? And, of course, Robinson... <laughs> Couldn't be happier, and they uh, along comes the bulldozers and the excavating equipment, and they dig out uh, uh, an inlet right on Ipswich Bay on the Crane Estate, and they named that Fox Creek. And then uh, uh, the elder Crane uh, went ahead and built his son-in-law, his new son-in-law, a first-class shipyard operation. Well. Uh, the war was coming. Uh, we could see the, uh, the situation in Europe uh, getting more dire as the days went by, and uh, uh, and Robinson was uh, had built uh, on this shipyard had built a couple sailing vessels. One he named after his wife, Florence Crane. It's a beautiful sailing vessel. And then uh, in 1939, a, a Portuguese man from Gloucester, Manuel Rocha. Uh, which is another interesting story. But anyway, he uh, engaged Robinson to build his first commercial fishing vessel for Gloucester, the Lady of Good Voyage. Uh, that was launched, and then the war soon uh, was, was heating up, 
and Yelder Crane, with his connections to the War Department, uh, saw to it that the, his uh, his uh, new son-in-law uh, might have an opportunity to bid on government vessels and things of that nature, uh, vessels of that nature, for the war effort uh, that was coming. So the Yard converted uh, to totally building government government vessels. Oh, that's my... Yeah, that's okay. You keep going. Right? So the Yard... Uh, the yard uh, transferred to government work, and uh, by virtue of being in the government business, uh, uh, employees of Robinson's uh, were deferred because they were involved in government work, and that allowed Robinson to go to Essex and rob all the shipwrights from Essex. They got deferments and so forth, oh. and they were close to home, and the well, the, the shipyard blossomed, and uh, it operated 24-7, three shifts around the clock, and they built a lot of vessels. Well, just to, uh, as an aside, uh, several years ago, a man called me. I was in the hospital with pneumonia, and I met my, my roommate, and turns out he's a carpenter, and so we got talking about different things, and he said, geez, is my father worked for Robinson Shipyard back in the 40s. And I said, oh, wonderful. So we talk, talk about different stories and so forth. Well, anyway, uh, several years later, uh, only five years ago, uh, I got a call. They said, I want to meet you down at the uh, coffee shop on, uh, on Bass Avenue. I have something for you. And um, I, my wife and I went down, and uh, he gave me uh, a bunch of pictures eight by ten glossies of the activity at Fox Creek in the 40s, the government vessels that were launched and so wow. forth. So I brought them here this morning and uh, awesome. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll show hold, you I'll, I, up to the camera. I'll show you these pictures. This is a launching at, uh, at, the, at the Crane Estate in uh, in, uh, during World War II. And here's the vessels, uh, the type of vessels that they were building. Wow. Look wow. at all the people. And this is, uh, this is another landing craft. So this is a military craft? Yes, it's all military that were being... For the World War II? For World War II at the Crane Estate. And here's another type of vessel that they built uh, there, landing crafts. <clears throat> I had no idea they were building ships there. Oh, uh, yeah. It's a big operation. But they would prefer that you didn't know this, and I'll get to that. Oh. Okay. And here's uh, the Navy sends a band down, and they, they, they play at these... Uh, huh. I do have one question, Ron. You said they you they prefer you didn't know it. Yes. But that last photo, not the one he just showed, the one previous, of all these people, and Scotty even said, wow, look at all those people. They kind of announced it, so everyone came to see it? Well, these are, uh, you know, at any launching, uh, it's a lot of family and a lot of workers and so forth. Yeah. Let's bring that, that photo back up. That was a, a, so, a big operation. So with that one? Yes. Yeah. So look at all the so, people that are here for this. So anyway... Uh, that was some big... Uh, that was a lot of people for something. Well, so, supporting war effort was a popular... Uh, so in my research, uh, the, the, I'm showing you the production that was going on in the, in the 40s. But in my research for my book in 2002, I was really uh, interested in this whole operation. And if, where do you go? I went to the library in Ipswich, my wife and I, and I noticed a reluctance on the part of the, libra the librarians and the people who worked there to even talk about this whole episode. Really? Well, uh, and furthering uh, my investigation, uh, it turns out that uh, uh, Florence Crane and her husband, uh, William A. Robinson, uh, 
got divorced at uh, about just after World War II, and it wasn't uh, it wasn't a pleasant situation. Uh, that wasn't real common in those days either, was that? No, it wasn't. No. no. So uh, anyway, <coughs> Robinson's activity as uh, a ship guard and his father-in-law's property was terminated. And uh, if you visit the Crane Estate today, uh, it's a lawn over there, and uh, oh. it, it never existed because overnight they tore the buildings down and so forth and so on. Is it, is it marked on, on current maps where Fox Creek is? No, no, I don't think so. No. Do you think that's why they're... However, uh, the evidence is uh, right down the street, uh, one of the things, because at Beacon Marine Base in Robinson, by the way, in 1944... Uh, and that's a story I talk about with uh, uh, Cameron's Cafe, uh, built uh, 12 vessels for Gloucester, 11 commercial fishing vessels, and an oil tanker, which I talked to you about the other day. Well, uh, Robinson, when he was thrown out, if you will, from the property, the Crane Estate, he reestablished himself just down the street in the Beacon Marine Basin, which is Alexander's property. But in those days, it was the Booth Fisheries, much like this was Gordon's property, and Booth had a big flake yard there and so forth, and Robinson, uh, after his divorce, bought Booth Fisheries and converted it to Robinson's Marine Basin, and he brought down the crane from the shipyard in Ipswich, and that crane is over at Alexander's today, that, that big, big crane. That big crane is, was, yes. it, was in operation in the 40s? Oh, yes. Wow. Was, yes. That's a that, great this story. This is good right. Gloucester gold right here. It's now, gold, I told you. That's why we got to have great. him on here before he dies on us. This now, in, that's right. <laughs> and that's why I want to be here. I know. Because, I know. Uh, we talk about this all the time. So, now, wait a second. Can I ask you a question? One question. Sure. Is the Mrs. Robinson that was on, on Eastern Point? Is she? Uh, I do, uh, no, I don't Do you know who so. I was talking about? No. Was, okay, okay. Uh, but anyway, uh, and also inside of, and I, funny, I talked with Jack Alexander only a couple of weeks ago at the building center. He's a great guy, and he's he's younger than I am, so he was only a, a toddler. Probably, Jeez, probably, guys, like, probably like Connor, your stepson. I thought, I thought you guys were the same age. No, no, no. He's younger. <laughs> Jack is only a boy. But Jack uh, is a good kid, and, uh, and I talked with Jack. And inside the Beacon Marine Basin, interesting, there's the longest lathe in the city. It's 40 feet long, and it came from the Ipswich shipyard of Robinson's. Can you explain what a lathe is? Inside this building over here, it's so big and so cumbersome and not needed that it's been resting there as a junk of iron for decades. Can you explain what a lathe is? Oh, a lathe. I'm sorry. I, That's okay. A lathe is a... Um, is a turning machine. It's uh, used to finish uh, shafts, mainly uh, uh, propeller shafts, and they come in various lengths, up to forty feet, at least for this lathe. There isn't much in the in the fishing fleet in Gloucester that that requires anything bigger, but in those days it required big lathes. Vessels, were, all of which were built, many of which were built at uh, Robinson Shipyard, but that became <coughs> That became the, the place where Robinson was moved to, if you will. And all the 12, the 11 vessels that he built in 1944 were all finished at Robinson's Marine Basin on East Main Street. Now, one of the vessels I talked about was the Emily Brown the other day. Uh, I went back to my, uh, handle this carefully, Joey, this is a, uh, this is the dust cover on my book, An Island No More, but that's the original, that's where the picture came from. And what year was this boat built? This boat was built, in, they were all, all of the boats built, in, were built in 1944, with the exception of Lady Good Voyage, which was the first one back in 1939. His last year, you see, World War II ended in 1945. But by 1943, the government saw the end in sight, and the pipeline was filled full of government vessels. So in 1943, they stopped ordering government things, and Robinson, in the throes of a divorce and 
Gloucester starving for fishing vessels. The demand was there. All these fishing vessels, the 11 fishing vessels, were ordered at once, and, Gla and Robinson's operating a 24-hour-a-day uh, work schedule. They were able to turn out all these vessels in one, in one year. That's amazing. So, uh, yes, when you compare it with an Essex-built vessel, it takes about nine months. It took about nine months to build one vessel. Um, so let me ask you a question on the sure. on the vessels. Uh, you said it was eleven vessels. Now yeah. were they made for for private entity or no? Or no, they were they were commercial fishing vessels. Commercial. In fishing. this case, so privately, you, individually owned, or for me, or for Gordon's company, or well, they were all they were individual for the most part, individually owned, uh, as this one was. Captain Frank Brown owned this vessel, and. Uh, uh, and how many feet was it? How, how many? This was a, uh, this vessel was ninety five feet. Ninety five uh, feet. Wow. And uh, and and believe me, I took a personal tour with my uncle when I was only uh, uh, nineteen forty four. I was eleven years old, and my my uncle. And what was and the I ship built out of? What type of materials? Oak. Uh, well, mainly oak. It's oak. a wooden vessel. Wooden it's vessels. Wooden, okay. Yeah, all these vessels were all wood that were built, uh, with the exception of the oil tanker Captain Dave which, of course, is steel, and it's still in existence today. Well, anyway, I got thinking about the Emily Brown and the Cameron's Cafe, because, you see, Captain Frank Brown was, the, was also the owner of Cameron's uh, Cafe, Cameron's Barroom, if you will, on Main Street, which they just tore down the, the new Cameron, not, the, not his uh, business place. But Captain Frank... You have, to under, you have to understand the times we lived in. It was 1945 when the Chamber of Commerce building was built also. So on Main uh, Street? On The original Hobbit. building? I, no. I heard Main, the original was on Main Street. Is that Yes, right? it was, down by the okay. curtain shop, but that was a rented facility, a okay. storefront. Then they moved from there, I don't know where, and they finally got to Commercial Street. But the building they're in today, and re renovating and building, was built in 1945 by uh, another um, entrepreneur, if you will, Larry McEwen, who was the sales manager for the Cooper Bessemer Company, the regional sales manager, and he built that building as a sales office. And where is that located? The one that's being renovated right now at Harbor for, Loop. For the people watching. Oh, <laughs> The one that's being renovated at the Harbor Loop today, where well, originally was the Cooper Bessemer office, sales office for the North Atlantic region, if you will. And most recently has been ha ha uh, Captain, whale Bill's, watch Captain of, Bill's Whale Watch yes. has been headquartered there for that's quite right. a while, and Cape Ann Oil, I think the office is for And Cape that's Ann. right. Uh, adjacent to the Fitzhugh so, Lane House? It's, it's, yep. It, yep. On the inside. Uh, it's only, it's probably, is it the only other? Yeah. Anyway. On that side. So if I could just if uh, so any uh, just to get back to uh, my wife and I researching uh, the history of uh, of uh, William A. Robinson Shipyard, uh, we went to the library in in Ipswich, and as soon as I mentioned the William A. Robinson era, phew, it visibly uh, they clammed up, if chilled. you will. <laughs> they did not want to discuss. This. The Crane people, the people in Ipswich, would like to just forget that whole chapter because of the uh, divorce-type situation in the end. It was not a pleasant thing. So there was a lot of reluctance. But however, after several visits, this uh, elderly lady took Joan and I down to the, the basement, and uh, we went into a vault-type arrangement, and, uh, and uh, she produced some... Uh, newspaper articles and other uh, memorabilia, and uh, you know you have to reconstruct your story. Uh, the details I'm not exactly. Uh, I'm not, it's not an exact uh, story, but uh, that basically is what it was. There was ill feeling and and so forth. That's why I say the town of Ipswich would prefer, or the people in Ipswich would prefer that we just forget about Robinsons. However. It was a very important era. Now, 
Captain Frank Brown was a very successful fishing skipper. The Portuguese fleet was very successful in those days. And when they made money, they reinvested and so forth. So as an investment, he bought Cameron's Cafe, even though he was fishing on his vessel, the Emily Brown. Cameron's Cafe was, a, you could say, a Portuguese uh, gathering place for captains and fishermen of the day. And uh, uh, they, uh, you know, they gathered there. It was, it was just an, it was just a really nice place, and uh, I, I, I was always impressed with it. I, I have been for since the early days. Well, anyway, Gloucester, as we all know, sponsors the schooner races on Labor Day, and there's a lot of rivalry and so forth. Well, that's an extension of the schooner races of back in the 20s and the, the 1900s. And we all know that history. Uh, uh, historians have talked about it for many, many years. But we've always had a, a, a rivalry uh, facet of the, of the fishing industry, racing. That's the, well, uh, it happened in uh, Cameron's Cafe back in 1945. Uh, the uh, Emily Brown was a, 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 the, all the 12, 11 vessels from it, which were all in existence. Most of them from uh, found homes in Gloucester. Some were built for uh, Fulton Fish Market and so forth. But anyway, uh, they, uh, and they mostly were built by Portuguese fishermen. They, they found Ipswich uh, uh, a place to go, and all the vessels that were built at Robinson Shipyard were all architecturally designed and they were state of the art for what they were. They were the Cadillacs of the day, the most, the, the, you know, the best. And, and Robinson had the best tradesmen, so they built the best vessels. Well, um, in going through my things yesterday, I found this picture. And uh, this is one of the vessels that was built in Essex, uh, in Ipswich. Now, now, the background on that vessel, the fishing vessel FV, fishing vessel Estrella. Rocky uh, Neck. Uh, yes, that's going Horton, out the harbor. But Horton, Horton Street. This was the biggest vessel that was built in 1944 at the shipyard. And Joaquin Gasper the captain and owner, uh, a Portuguese man, was, uh, you know, he was ahead of his time, and he wanted the best. And his family had been building vessels since the 20s, early 20s. This represents probably a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh vessel that he had ownership of and so forth. At the time, in 1944, this was his flagship, This and it was the city's flagship. It was powered by a 600 horsepower Atlas heavy duty Imperial diesel engine that came in on a freight car from Oakland, California, up to our local depot. The 600 horsepower engine in those days was considered the Cadillac, and it was the most power of any vessel in the harbor. She had more power than any other vessel. Well, Joaquin Gaspers in. Uh, in uh, Cameron's, and he's uh, bragging about his new vessel, and uh, oh, and you know, she really goes fast, and so forth. And uh, there was another captain there, another Portuguese man, kept by the name of Bob Freilich. And Bob Freilich, as I remember him, uh, I put water on all these vessels, so I know them closely. Uh, anyway, Bob was a, a gentleman, uh, he looked to me. You look like a Greek god, handsome, Portuguese, oh, just and and a nice gentleman too. He was the captain of a fishing vessel by the name of the Curl. And there's the uh, the the Curl. Uh, the background on the Curl is, uh, is this. The background on the Curl is that she was built in Rhode Island in a shipyard that was, uh, had a one-man owner. He was the only guy that, 
that worked on these on this vessel. He built this vessel single handedly. Oh when a heavy work, they recruited somebody to help them. But it was said at the time that uh, the there was enough rejected. There was more rejected wood on the side of the shipyard than what the wood that went into the vessel. He he was a meticulous guy. He wanted nothing but the best. And this vessel was built for in the day in that day for General Seafoods of Boston. And she come out her original name was the Blow, B L O W. Blow, Squall, Calm. That was the some of the vessels they had. This one was the, but it was the smallest. She didn't carry a lot of fish and she was powered with a three hundred and fifty horsepower Cooper Bessemer engine. Now the Atlas and the Cooper Bessemer were the engines of choice in those days. They were the Cadillacs, but the Cooper Bessemer was considered even better, and it was more expensive. The salesman and the New England representative of the Cooper Bessemer Company was Captain Larry McEwen. I say captain because he was the fourth striper in the United States Navy Reserve, and he opened the Chamber of Commerce office on on Duncan Street, Harbor Loop. His previous location was next to the Empire Fish Company on the lot after the building center. He, he, he didn't open it as the Chamber of Commerce. He opened it as oh, the, that, he the, opened it as, as the he had it built. sales office for the Cooper, Cooper Bessemer. Right. Yeah, he had a demonstration engine in there yeah. and and a parts department and uh, uh, he had several employees, not the at least of which was a gal by the name of Isabel Gray. And Isabel Gray, when he was activated in the service, Isabel Gray ran the whole operation, and she was a gal Friday personified. She's number one person, personal friend of mine, and I interviewed her for my book and so forth. And just as an aside, she told me that it was such a prosperous era that captains would come in to order engines, and if they said, well, the engine is $28,000. Oh, that's okay. Order up. Price was not an option. It, it, it just because the industry, you know, what we see today compared to that. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, Bob Fraylitz in the, in the Camerons, and in comes Gasper, and he says, oh, and by the way, the Curl, oh, the Curl went to Boston for General Seafoods, and because the Atlantic Fishermen's Union at the time was so strong in Boston, they required 17 men to go aboard the Curl. Well, she only carried about 170,000 redfish or haddock or codfish or whatever. Not enough to make it worthwhile for 17 men. So essentially, the, the Union uh, discouraged this, this vessel and... Because Larry McEwen was selling all the engines, Cooper Bessemer's, to the General Seafoods fleet in Boston, the owners of the hierarchy in, in uh, General Seafoods said to Larry, listen, this has got your engine in it. It's, why don't you buy this boat and take it to Gloucester and see what you can do with it? We, we can't make it financially up here because of the union. So Larry acquired this boat. He had a boat before that, the Golden Eel. There were two, the Golden Eagle. Now he had the Blow, which he renamed the Curl when she came to Gloucester. So, Bob Fralex, the skipper, and this is the fastest boat in harbor. This thing, the Curl, but not the, curl the, was not the, the Australia. The Curl was the fastest thing in the harbor. Even though the Curl had a 300 horsepower 350. engine, and the, and the other one had a 600. 600. So, but it, in, it was that much bigger? The Australia was that much bigger? Yes, it was. Well, it was not that much bigger, but. But Listen, 300 to 350 to 600, you would think that there would be a big advantage. Yes, that's right. Yes, you would. Well, however, the design of the Estrella and the configuration of this blow curl was totally different back aft. This one had an elliptical stern, and there were reasons for her speed. But she had a 350 Cooper Vesma. This guy had a 600 Atlas. In comes Gasper, and he says, I challenge you to a race, and uh, uh, Bob these are powered. Bob these, Bob this, this, says, is a, this isn't a sailboat race. This no, isn't schooners. These are powered vessels. Powered vessels. So the arrangements. It's an interesting story. So uh, uh, 
they agreed to race, and uh, they're going to race to Thatchett's Island. From where? Were, from where? From Ten Pound Island, they were going to Thatchett's. Wow. Okay. So, uh, there was, it was going like to... Yeah, I love this. I'm dying to hear that. It was going to happen at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So, uh, What were the stakes? Do you know what the stakes no, were? I, it was just, I, I don't know what the stakes <clears throat> were. But was it so, a pink slip? What's that? was it a pink slip. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the crew is waiting on station by the island. The engine's going. Now the crew had, as, a, as an aside, the crew had uh, one of the best engineers in the city I looked him up this morning, and his name was Gerard Real. I went to school with his, his daughter Priscilla. She married a Cunningham and so forth and so on. Priscilla's still with us today, and they lived on Point Hill. And Gerard Real uh, was master mechanic. He could squeeze every ounce of power out of anything. So he's the engineer on the curl. Along comes the Estrella. Gasper. It's got that 600 horsepower engine wide open. He tears by the he tears by the crew that's in neutral, idling. Gerard Real, they give him one bell for to go ahead. He gives them the one bell. He pulls it. Another bell to jingle it up, and then the jingle, which is a like a, a, a buzzer, that means wide open. And Gerard put it right the metal pedal to the metal. And the curl is following behind the Estrella. They go by, they go by the the, uh, the breakwater, and the curl is right on the tail of that Estrella. They get by the breakwater, a little sea room, and the curl pulls ahead of the Estrella and pulls ahead. By the time they got to Thatcher's Island, the Estrella was way behind, and the next morning, it was out of sight. They were gone. It, Curl won won the race and the Estrella got beat. Even anyway. though even though the boats were not that yeah. not that uh, size wise were not huge difference, yeah. but the Curlew had a, a three hundred fifty horsepower 300, engine yeah, yeah. and the Estrella had a six hundred yeah. horsepower engine. Yeah. That's interesting to me. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I, it was a, it was a big thing in those days. It was. And, oh, you know, I'm sure. And of course, the Estrella was first class. Uh, there was nothing. Uh, Joaquin Gasper built probably 10 vessels in his lifetime and all his vessels were showpieces. He, uh, there's one thing about the Portuguese, they spared no horses when it came to their vessels. They were the best and so forth. So I anyway, have to take a break for a second just for sure. a, a restroom break. I could not leave because that was so interesting and yeah. I had to find out who won yeah. before yeah. I took my little break. Yeah. Go right ahead. I'll be right back. I want to hear some more. Okay. I'm going to give you, I'm gonna give you a, uh, one little uh, anecdote yep. in relation to the way that the Estrella uh, approached that race, how he steamed by him while the guy was in neutral. Yeah. yeah. If you ever, when you go to the Gre the same boat races for the St. Peter's Fiesta, if you, some people are on the beach and they can't understand why it takes so long to get those races started. There's three coxmen and they're in charge of the the the, the, the three boats are lined up on the beach facing towards the flags where they have to race that two, turn around and come back and hit the beach. Well, the, they instruct the crews to put the tips of their oars in to try to get an edge, to try to uh, feather the boats forward towards the flags. And the coxman, his job is to, they, when they think that they have a little bit of an advantage or, that, or at least fair, they'll put their hand up to the race starter saying, okay, w like we're, we're ready to go. Now, they won't start the race until all three coxmen, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, all have their hands up in the air, and then he'll, he'll signal the race to start. But there's so much jockeying that it, it may take 20 minutes to get the race started. We saw that last year. We yeah. saw that. Yeah. There was I assume they were trying to get an advantage. Yeah. They're trying to, they're, so they're, the they're, they're feathering they're, 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 some of the, the boats, they're feathering their, their oars to, into the water to try to get momentum going forward. And if one of the crews it, like seems that they're definitely not in position to start the race, they'll actually like turn the boat like and make it so that there's no way that they would start it. You know, it's it's kind of interesting mm -hmm. that they would 
that they got the Estrella. He, he, well, he, he approached the race with a head of steam there. Yeah, well, let me tell you uh, about the Estrella. She was an absolutely beautiful vessel. And I, as I say, in 1944, I was 11 years old, and I was on the water, a boat called Water Boat in the harbor, delivering water to all these vessels. So uh, John Winneberg, who owned the Wynnum Lake, the Water Boat, lived on Plum Street, and uh, I had an occasion to go over to uh, Kim uh, Smith's house one day with a book, and, uh, and across the street was uh, John Winneberg's house. John Winneberg was a widower, and, uh, you know, he had kept a widower's home, and uh, he didn't eat too well, and so forth and so on. He's an elderly man, and he's running this water boat, which is uh, out, of, out of sync with the times. And, and I'm the little kid aboard there that's helping him. So John would take the water boat over and tie it up at Booth's Wharf, which was Robinson's Marine Basin, and walk up Plum Street, have his lunch, and have a little nap, and then come down Plum, go aboard the boat, and come across the harbor to Gardens of Gloucester, which was on that side of the harbor, they're another part of their business, and I would wait, I'd be waiting for him. Well, uh, in those days, the vessels dried their nets, and they hung, they had to haul them up to the top of the spa uh, to dry out, and it created like a hammock, so as a little kid, I, waiting for the water boat to come from across the harbor, I laid in, the, in that net uh, like a hammock, and I'm waiting, and I can hear the engine on the water boat come putt, 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 coming across the harbor. And just at the right time, horns bled all over the harbor. Whoa, whoa, startled me, right? Well, it was the Estrella coming from the fitting out dock, Robinson's coming over to the United Fisheries, which is where that laboratory is today on uh, yeah. East Main Street. Uh, that's morning. where oh, okay, yeah. United Institute. Fisheries facility yeah. was, and that was a Portuguese wharf, and the Estrella was coming over. And I can see her now, the only vessel in the whole fleet, so reminiscent of Joaquin Gasper, painted her all white. She was just like a yacht, and the, the gang, the crew were all there, and it was just an unbelievable thing. Uh, it's just a, a memory I have. Anyway. Well, there you go. So. Well, thank you so much for that. That's awesome. I appreciate well, that's this. all I can tell you today, yeah. Joseph. Well, we're gonna we're just gonna keep ramping up these these stories week yeah. in and week out and try to get them all recorded. I uh, yes, I, I, I if I may, I like uh, you know at the last probably seven or eight years, I've uh, attempted to put this information down because. Uh, while I'm not an authority, I'm the last guy standing, and all the uh, noted historians in, in the city of Gloucester have all passed on. They left behind books and so forth, which we were fortunate to have. Uh, but, uh, you know, I have personal knowledge of this era, and it was the golden age of fishing, and I'm attempting to uh, record it in my good, blog, good. Uh, the, videos, the, and the so Gloucester forth. I love. Two. Uh, two. Yeah. Uh, online. Joe, yeah. I'm about to steal this guest of yours for personal use if you if you, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you don't mind because I'm gonna I'm gonna give you uh, a, an invite, an official invite. So I do the um, the narration on the Bullport cruise line yeah. for the senior tours during the daytime for oh. the lobster bakes. And I point out different points of interest around the harbor. Oh, Would really? you be interested? Well, I can, I, could, uh, when, could I, when please, I tell you this Could story? I please have you out one day? Wait till I tell you Okay. Story. My wife, uh, we had visitors come from out of town. And at the time, there was a duck. That's a World War II amphibious craft that was operating at a pavilion, the end of Pavilion Beach between the tavern and the boulevard. And I said to Joan, I said, you know, it'd be nice if we take our visitors on this duck and they give a tour around the harbor. Well, we got on the duck and we pulled off from the beach and we're going along. And there's this young lady, probably 18 or 20. And she's got the microphone and she's narrating this tour. Well, she was, you know, I... The, I know she meant well, and she certainly wasn't dishonest, but she was telling facts that were off the wall. And where the <laughs> place 
The boat had a I'm just going to hand my microphone over. Yeah, I'm scared to have you on board now. Right. Uh, listen, <laughs> That's probably what I'm doing. <laughs> the boat had about 40 people on. Finally, I said, would you mind if I take that microphone from you? <laughs> he passed it to me. It's and all I, yours. And I narrated, I narrated the tour. And that's, that's the well, God bless you. Okay. I would love anyway, to have you on as a special guest if you don't Well, I'll accept. tell you one more story. Uh, I was involved with the adventure. Uh, when, uh, I'm, I was involved with the adventure in 1987 when we brought her here from, Cam, from uh, Camden, Maine. Uh, not, no, she was at Camden, but we brought it. We, she was in mothballs at Bath, Maine, and we took it down the, uh, the uh, Kennebec River into Gloucester. Jim Sharp was the owner, Skipper. He was giving it to us, and I was on the original uh, adventure committee. So we were allowed, uh, he had his own crew that were going to bring the vessel down. But I was, being on the board of directors, Gallon said, you're in charge of taking the Gloucester contingent, which were members of the board, uh, as, a, as a complimentary uh, thing from him, as he said. And he made, made me the, the captain of my little contingent. Well, uh, he, there was a reason for it. He didn't want to... There were so many volunteers, he put me in charge so that I could say no to all these people. Yeah. Well, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> Bad guy. We, uh, uh, we, came, we came down from uh, Camden, Maine, and uh, uh, we brought the boat here and so forth and so on. And, you know, $5 million later and 30 years later, our friend that we gave the roof job to, uh, the organ organist, the organ, the organ maker? Yeah. C CB Fisk? No. Hammond? The guy that worked for him. You, you called me and wanted a, uh, uh, a name of a roofer, and uh, he worked for... Hack? No, he worked for CB Fisk. Anyway, he's involved... Greg with, Bover? Yes, that's the guy. Great, nice guy. I didn't know guy. he was a roofer. No, no, he wasn't. He asked you for the name oh, of a oh, roofer, oh, and oh, I gave it to you. Craig oh, Bover. Oh, Greg Bover, yeah. Great, great guy. guy. Great guy. Uh, uh, he's... You know, he's fired up and he's interested in the adventure. So he said to me a couple, three years ago, he says, Ron, you were on that adventure in the very beginning. I'd like to have you on Wednesday. It's the, uh, it's a, uh, the day to the, the members of the association can, and their guests can go for free for sale. And, the, and I'd like to invite you along. I said, well, you know, I says, now it's been many years since I've been aboard that vessel and so forth. So... I said to my wife, well, I'll, I'll go down. So around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we were going to leave the wharf, and I went down, and there were probably 25 or 30 people, directors, and so forth. Well, as it turned out, we, uh, you know, we, we pulled out from the wharf, and there wasn't a breath of air. And, of course, for, uh, <laughs> you know, for interest, they raised the sails, and, they, you know, and we fortunately had a little donkey engine there. She has a little GM in her that pushes her along. And anyway, well, as it turned out, uh, the captain came forward and at the break, and the crew members and the guests and so forth, and I wound up giving them the uh, speech on the adventure and all that type of thing. So, uh, what can I say? Yes, I've done that before. Thank you very so much. Anyway, Thank you. That's the story. Yeah. Beautiful. All right, there you go. Um, so... I think we can wrap it up right here. Do you, Pat, did you have anything else? I'm good. Pat, all right, I'll add, I'll add stuff into the show notes uh, with links. I put a link in to Ron's blog. Listen, what Ron, as much as Ron can speak, there is an absolute treasure <coughs> trove of information and photos <coughs> on his blog, The Gloucester I Love Too. And there is a link, there will be a link in the show notes for you to be able to find it. Um, and if you can't, if you don't want to do that, you can go to your Google machine. And type it, and just type in the Gloucester I love too, and that'll bring you there as well. Ron, thank you so much for coming, Jimmy, Scotty, Pat, Joey, uh, your host you. Joey Shimatao. I hope, uh, yeah, Scotty, I hope nice meeting Ron, you. Yes, my pleasure. Thank you, Ron. Nice Got to see everybody. Got nothing else to do someday. Look it up. Uh, thank right. you so much. You got it. Okay, we're off. We're off. Yep.